Greetings, my name is Tom Irvine, and I'm the instructor for this series of Shock and Vibration webinar units. And I again thank Dr. Curtis Larson and the NASA Engineering and Safety Center, NESC, for making this series of webinar units possible. Our topic for today is sign on random vibration, and this is a very interesting topic. So there's many different scenarios in which sign on random vibration can occur. Uh, helicopter vibration, for example. And with a helicopter, there's a main rotor and a tail rotor. And there's a certain number of, of blades per each of those rotors. And there's a series of uh, sinusoidal oscillations that will set up at the uh, what's called the blade passing frequencies. And we've talked about those before in a previous unit. And of course, there's also uh, broadband random vibration in the background. Uh, another example is propeller-driven aircraft. A, a similar effect occurs with sign-on random vibration. There can be gunfire. And in some of these, the, the first three bullets are covered in MIL standard 810G. Uh, there are various types of sign-on random specifications in that standard, uh, depending on uh, the, the vehicle and uh, blade passing frequencies and so on. In the case of gunfire, there's uh, uh, me methods for determining the appropriate uh, sign on random test levels as well. And then the fourth bullet shows launch vehicle with thrust oscillation. So for the case of a solid rocket motor, for example, there's the possibility that a standing wave uh, pressure oscillation will set up in the uh, combustion cavity. And that will create uh, what's sometimes called a a thrust oscillation or resonant burn uh, type of effect. And of course there's also uh, with the launch vehicle broadband random vibration. Now some of that broadband random vibration does come from the uh, combustion process and is structural born. But there's also the uh, external aerodynamic effects such as the uh, turbulent boundary layers and shock waves and uh, other type of flow effects that are occurring as well. But uh, the, the, b the bottom line is that each in, the, in each of these cases, there is the potential for a sign on random uh, vibration environment. And there often is, in fact. So ultimately, what we're concerned about is designing and testing electronic components to withstand these uh, various sign on random vibrations that a given vehicle will encounter. And we've got, we've got two approaches that we're going to cover in this unit. And the first approach is we're going to say, OK, given a sign on random specification, how do we go about synthesizing a time history to satisfy that specification? Now, once we have that time history, we can then use it for a shaker table test of an electronic component. Or we could use it as an input for uh, some type of a structural response analysis. And that uh, the, the model uh, could be just a simple spring mass system, or it could be something complex like a finite element model. And, 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 and in, any, in any event, the, the time history that we synthesize would then become the base excitation function for that model. Now the second bullet there shows that another approach that we can take uh, that is sometimes desirable or, or even necessary is we can take that sign on random test specification and convert it to an equivalent power spectral density. Then again, that equivalent power spectral density could be used for either design or test purposes. So here is a hypothetical sign on random specification. It, it does not come from any particular uh, mill standard uh, per se. Uh, it's just one that I made up, but the but the actually th let me clarify that a bit. The blue curve there is the power spectral density. So what we have here, let me back up. We have a double y-axis plot, and the left axis is the acceleration in g squared per hertz, and that's for the blue curve. Then the green these green uh, spectral lines here, those correspond to the right hand vertical axis, and that, that's the acceleration g for the, um, the two sinusoidal components uh, as shown there. Now, 
just as a point of clarification, the blue curve here actually does come from the, uh, the NAVMAT specification, which we've used many times before. And I'm kind of playing around with this, uh, doing kind of a hybrid thing here, where I've superimposed two sinusoidal tones. The first is at 100 hertz. The second is at 180 hertz. And in each case, the amplitude will be 10 Gs. So this is just a hypothetical sign-on random specification that we're going to use uh, for some, some analytical purposes here, uh, per, per the two methods uh, that I uh, briefly outlined in the previous slide. So we're going to synthesize a 60-second time history to satisfy the sign-on random specification. And we're going to do this in two parts. Um, first of all, the, the coordinates or breakpoints for the NAVMAT uh, specifications, those are already available to us in our MATLAB package uh, as a library function. So we're going to read in that NAVMAT PSD as we've done before, and we're going to synthesize a time history that will satisfy only the power spectral density specification. That'll be step one. And then as a follow-on step, we, we're going to add the two sine tones to that time history. So I'm going to show you how to do that here using our MATLAB uh, package, our vibration data GUI package that we've uh, used so many times before. And let me just do a little bit of uh, maintenance here. Got some other plots that I want to uh, close out. So let's go to our vibration data GUI package. And this week we're up to version 6.8 and rising. Now if we wanted to, if we had whatever PSD we might have, we could manually enter that in into our uh, command window. Or we could have it as, a, as, as an external ASCII text file that we could call in. Or even, even an Excel spreadsheet file. But in our case, we, this NAVMAT specification is already available to us as a library function. So let's go to our um, import data to, to MATLAB. And we, here we have this uh, library array. It's a NAVMAT PSD specification, so let's read that in. So that has two columns, frequency in hertz, and the acceleration in g squared per hertz. So that's uh, read into our workspace there. Now the next step, and, and pretty much this is all a review so far, let's go in ahead and take that PSD and let's synthesize a time history. We're going to start with white noise. We're going to synthesize a time history to satisfy that power spectral density. So let's begin our signal analysis here. And, okay, preload it into ma Well, let me back up. We've run this before, but let me just uh, say again, this script synthesizes an acceleration time history to satisfy a PSD beginning with white noise. And preloaded into MATLAB, we have NAVMAT underscore spec with uh, units in English and 60 seconds duration. And let's go ahead and view our processing options for the synthesis. So our first breakpoint is at 20 hertz, so we want our delta F to be uh, somewhere lower than 20 hertz. So let's just do row 9 there. That will give us a delta F of about 4.3 hertz with, uh, over, with, well, with 512 statistical degrees of freedom. So that's a good number of statistical degrees of freedom. And let's calculate the uh, synthesized time history as we've done on numerous occasions. Have to wait for a couple of progress bars to finish up there. Okay. So figure two here, this is our synthesized acceleration time history. Has an overall level of 6.06 .06 GRMS. And since the mean value is uh, equal to zero, we can say that that RMS value is also the one sigma standard deviation. We have acceleration G versus time in seconds. And if we zoom in a couple of times, we can see that, yea, verily, this is uh, broadband random vibration. It's no longer white noise because now it's, it's satisfying a shaped 
power spectral density, but it, it is still broadband random vibration. Corresponding velocity has a mean value of zero. Corresponding displacement also has a mean value of zero. So we have a well-behaved set of acceleration, velocity, and displacement there. Here is the, the acceleration histogram. So this is for the instantaneous values of the acceleration time history. So along the y-axis we have counts, and al on the x-axis this is acceleration in g. So this acceleration in g is, is really divided up into bins, and we just count how many instantaneous values fall within each bin. And if we look at the overall shape, this is a bell curve or normal distribution. Now if we take a uh, power spectral density for our synthesized time history, so we get uh, g squared per hertz, which is really grms squared per hertz along the y-axis, and along the x-axis is frequency in hertz. Now our NavMat specification is the red curve. So we've got log-log format, straight line segments for the specification. Then the two black lines are the plus and minus one and a half dB tolerance. And the blue curve here, this is the power spectral density of our synthesized time history. And you can see that it complies with our specification uh, well within tolerance bands. So, so far this exercise is something we've done maybe a dozen or so times before in this webinar series. But now we're going to add on to it. So we're going to we're going to save that acceleration time history that only satisfies the random portion. So I'm going to call that Excel underscore th, and I'm going to save that to the MATLAB workspace. So that is now saved. Then the next step is to add those two sinusoidal tones. So that's going to be a separate step. So I'm going to click on this button here. So this is a new function for today. So the input array must have two columns, time in seconds and acceleration g. And we have that with that synthesized time history. In our case, we have two sine tones. And we've got 100 hertz and 180 hertz. And we have 10 g's and 10 g's. Um, now, f f phase angle is a little bit tricky here. When we're not going to spend too much time on it. In this case, we have two sinusoidal terms, and this is a, if we take a ratio or scale these, whatever, if we divide uh, uh, 180 by 100, that comes out to ratio of 1.8, which is a non-integer ratio. So anytime we have a non-integer ratio, uh, th these phase angles don't really matter. But if we had like a, an integer ratio set up between our frequencies, then, well, yes, the, the phase angle is going to affect the results and will re require some additional thought. I, I will say that uh, for all the sign-on random specifications I've ever come across, there is no control or specification in regards to phase angle. That's only, the specification is only for frequency and acceleration. So if you're, if you're concerned about phase angle for, for, for the case where you have integer harmonics, then kind of play around with these yourself and uh, see what makes the most sense. And m maybe we'll cover those in a future webinar, but, but not today. For, t for today, it's fine just to leave the phase angles at zero. So we have our uh, time history here, and we need to click on the read button to get that read in. And we've got our uh, two sine tones set up. So now we're going to calculate. We're going to synthesize the, com the combined sine on random time history. So we get a bunch of figures coming up. And I, I guess before I do anything else, I want to just save this. So I'm going to save this as SOR for sine on random underscore TH. So this is going to be our saved sine on random time history. We're going to be using that for some other exercises. So let's see what we have here. Here's our sign on random acceleration time history. And it has an overall level of 11.6 GRMS. We've got acceleration G versus time in seconds. So what's going to happen when we zoom in on this a couple of times? 
Well, what is that? It's <laughs> and the answer is it's in the title. It's a sign on random time history. It's, it, 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 it's sort of a hybrid. It's sort of a mixture there. So we have a sign on random time history for acceleration. Corresponding velocity shown here. Corresponding displacement shown here. In each of the three cases, the mean value, the respective mean value, is equal to zero. And that's actually important for test and analysis purposes. What about the uh, the histogram? So if we take an if we take the instantaneous values in this acceleration time history and take the histogram, what do we get? Well, there it is. We've got counts along the y-axis. And along the x-axis, we have acceleration. And actually, I need to go back and clarify that and put acceleration in G there. So that's an that's a action item for myself, I guess. But, but anyways, as we look at this shape here, well, it's no longer a bell curve. It's kind of like a bell curve, but it's, it's not the Gaussian bell curve we're accustomed to, to viewing. In fact, it's more kind of a triangular thing. It's more of a triangular shell, shape. But that's not a completely true description either because th th these sections out here, we call these tails. So this, this is like, like, a, like a brim, I guess, like a hat brim. Uh, we, we've got these tails going on on both the negative and positive ends. So uh, this is sort of a hybrid histogram. It doesn't have any particular descriptive name that I know, know of offhand. I'll just call it the, uh, the, the sign on random histogram. So just sort of keep that uh, in the back of your mind. Um, we might just take a look at some other statistical parameters for our sign on random time history. So let's go to our statistical function here. And let's call in that, uh, that uh, sign on random time history that we just generated or synthesized. Really what I need to do is take some of these additional statistic functions and put them into the... Uh, uh, directly into the sign tone function. So maybe I'll uh, assign myself an action item for that. But but anyways, here's we get some additional uh, viewing of statistical parameters. Some of these maybe we're not so interested in. But uh, okay, there's the, the histogram. You've seen that before for this sign on random time history. And there's the sign on random time history, which you have seen before. But this also gives us some additional information, the kurtosis. Let's take a look at kurtosis there. Now, for pure sine vibration, the kurtosis is 1.5. For broadband, stationary, random vibration, we expect a, a Gaussian distribution with a kurtosis equal to 3.0. Or I should say we... we if, 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 if the histogram is Gaussian, then the kurtosis will be 3.0. Well, in this case, we've got a hybrid signal. It's a mixed sign on random. So we get sort of an in-between or intermediate kurtosis value. So that's just a little feature. So you can just sort of keep that in the back of your minds. It's good just to develop some critical thinking skills as we approach these signals and just try and understand them a little better. So let's go back to the uh, let's go back to the slides here briefly, and you can probably imagine what we're going to do next. We're going to uh, okay, we've we've done the synthesis process, and I think what what I actually have next here are just the uh, the screenshots. This is what I've just demonstrated in class, but or in this webinar recording, I should say. But then I I, I include these in the slides. Uh, just in case you need to go back and refer to these. Um, as always, I encourage you to do these exercises as homework. So that's how we read in the NAVMAT specification. We uh, synthesized a time history to satisfy uh, only the uh, random PSD portion. So here's our synthesized acceleration time history, the, the slide version. Uh, the acceleration histogram for that time history for the PSD only. The PSD verification step where we show good compliance with our specification. Then we added our sign tones. So this was the step where we added our sign tones, the two sign tones. 
Then we got our uh, sign on random acceleration time history. And in this case here, I've noted the, the kurtosis is equal to 2.6. This is for the uh, PowerPoint slide version. And the crest factor is 3.9. That's the, the ratio of the peak, you know, I guess the peak, I guess, probably is this, this is probably the peak here, the peak absolute. So take the peak absolute and divide by the RMS, and that's the crest factor of 3.9 for this case. Then here's a close-up or zoomed-in view of our sine on random acceleration. Here's the histogram for our sine on random uh, signal for the instantaneous acceleration values. And it, it somewhat is departing from the Gaussian ideal. So it's, it's no longer the pure uh, bell curve that we expect for a normal distribution. The corresponding velocity for the sine on random signal and the corresponding displacement for the sign on random signal. And the mean value is zero, and, and that's something that's done on purpose. I've I purposely designed the synthesis process and written the software so the displacement mean value comes out to be zero. And that's important, for example, if you're doing a finite element analysis and we're using the acceleration as a base input and we want to get the uh, the displacements at various points on the structure or the relative displacements. It, it, it is much better to have a well-behaved uh, displacement that oscillates about the zero baseline uh, for that sort of analysis. Uh, had we not done this, uh, had, had I not done the, the, the steps that are embedded in the software, the velocity would have had a, a constant offset and the displacement would have had a ski slope effect. But I've taken measures doing different sorts of trend removals uh, so that for each of the three amplitude metrics, the respective mean values are equal to zero. Okay, now here's here's what we do next, our favorite thing. We're going to take that sign on random time history that we have just synthesized, and we are going to apply that as a base input to a spring mass system. So we have mass, uh, we've got the Hooke's Law, gives us a stiffness K. We have the viscous damping coefficient C, Y double dot, base acceleration, X double dot, acceleration response of the mass. And we're going to have a 200 hertz system with a Q is equal to 10. And we're going to find out how it responds to our sign on random time history. So part of this is going to be a review exercise, but there is a different uh, twist to it in that for the first time ever, we're going to have a sign on random time history as the uh, base input. So let's go to, uh, we've got a time history base input, SDOF response to base input. So we've run this before. This script calculates the response of a single degree of freedom system to base excitation. The input data must have two columns, time in seconds and base acceleration. So our time history is SOR underscore TH. We've got a 200 hertz system, Q is equal to 10. Let's calculate the response in the time domain. So we get some interesting uh, plots that come up. We can, uh, let's just take a look first at our descriptive statistics. So our crest factor for the response is 2.87. Kurtosis is approximately equal to 2.0. Again, that's for the absolute acceleration response. Here is the, okay, that's the base input acceleration time history, and you have seen that one before. So I'm going to park that off to my second monitor out of your view. Okay, acceleration response time history, 200 hertz, Q is equal to 10. And what kind of a characteristics does this response have? And, uh, not surprising, it has a fairly sinusoidal response in terms of frequency at 200 hertz. We do see some random uh, variation on the amplitude envelope. And then there's a relative displacement response there. Now here is the histogram. This is very interesting. This is our uh, histogram of the acceleration response of our spring mass system to the base input, where the base input is that sign on random. And it's not, a, it's not a bell curve, it's not a bathtub curve, it's kind of a, a hybrid 
And I suppose someone might look at that and say, oh, that's a bimodal histogram. And ma ma maybe that's a good uh, descriptive uh, uh, label as well. But uh, it's, 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 it's kind of an interesting kind of a, a hybrid effect going on where the system prefers to, to, to respond you know, if, if these negative peaks and, the, and these positive peaks, but there are some kind of outlier points as well as some filled in in between. Well, here's another th interesting thing we can do. Uh, what if we have a natural frequency equal to 180 hertz, which would match one of our sine tones? So let's go ahead and match one of the sine tones. So we have, uh, we're going to have a resonant response at 180 hertz. Do the calculation. And here's the histogram for this case. So 180 hertz is one of the sine tones, and 180 hertz is also the natural frequency of the spring mass system. So it, it becomes more of a bathtub curve, although not a perfectly a perfect bathtub curve. Then for the 180 hertz natural frequency case, we can zoom in on this. And we're getting a, a nice sinusoidal response with some uh, variation of the amplitude envelope. Okay, so hopefully that's all straightforward. So uh, the bottom line, I guess, so far is that now that we have this uh, time history, which we've called SOR underscore TH, we can apply that to a model, a structural dynamics model. In this case, we did it just for a, uh, a spring mass system. Or we could also do that for a, a finite element model and I'm not going to go through this in its entirety, but if we want to take that acceleration time history and extract it, for example, to a NASTRAN format, we can go back to the home page for vibration data, click on export, and there's an option to uh, export the acceleration time history into a NASTRAN friendly format. And the amplitude is going to be, ex is going to be acceleration G from our synthesis, and if we want to make that amplitude inches per second squared, we would do a we would apply a scale factor of 386 as part of our export process. Uh, I'm not going to actually do that now, but I'm just showing you that if you need to do that, um, th these are the steps. Okay, so what else? Let's go back to our slides here uh, for a moment or so. Oops. So there's the spring mass system. Then these are just uh, screenshots uh, similar to what we've just done. So we're applying the uh, sign on random time history as a base input in this slide. We have a sign on random response. We've got a histogram here. Okay, we're going to do a couple other things, and the reason for doing this will become clear uh, later on. And we're actually going to allow the, uh, the natural frequency to be an independent variable for each of these two calculations. And the Q value is going to be fixed at Q is equal to 10. That's equivalent to 5% damping. And our fatigue exponent, we're going to set that equal to 6.4. And this is the value that Steinberg uses in his uh, reference book, uh, Vibration Analysis for Electronic Equipment. Then the two functions we're going to calculate are the SRS, the shock response spectrum, and the fatigue damage spectrum, the FDS. So let's do that. So let's go to vibration data. And we've got a time history and a shock response spectrum. This function we've run before, so this is kind of a review. This script calculates the shock response spectrum of a single degree of freedom system to base excitation. The input array must have two columns, time in seconds and acceleration. So in this case, we have our SOR underscore TH, our sign on random. Q is equal to 10. And let's go from 10 to 2,000 hertz for our plotting. Let's calculate that SRS. This is a, a long time history, so it's going to take a, a bit of time. Oh, I'm, I'm, yeah, okay. And let's see, I've got a bunch of plots. Some of these are popping up to the right here, and some are going to be more interesting than others. 
Okay, here is the acceleration SRS. I've carefully noted that Q is equal to 10. Peak acceleration G along the Y axis. Along the X axis is natural frequency in Hertz. And not surprisingly, we have a spectral peaks at 100 Hertz and 180 Hertz corresponding to that sinusoidal portion, uh, the two sine tones. I've got a couple other plots off uh, on my second monitor showing the pseudo velocity, the relative displacement, and the tripartite here. There's the tripartite. Okay, what we're going to do now is we're going to save the absolute acceleration SRS, which is the, the envelope of the, of the two curves there. Let's just save that. I'm going to save that as SOR for sign on random uh, SRS. So that shock response spectrum is now going to be saved into the MATLAB workspace. Now our next step is going to be to do a fatigue damage spectrum. So there's a couple ways we can do this. We can go time history, fatigue damage spectrum. We could also access the fatigue damage spectrum via the fatigue toolbox. Either way, come to the same place. We've run this before. This script calculates the fatigue damage spectrum for an acceleration time history. The input file must have two columns, time in seconds, acceleration G. So SRS underscore TH. Uh, normally, 1 12th octave would be about right for frequency spacing, but we're going we're gonna to be a little more detailed and go 1 24th. English units, acceleration, fatigue metric. Let's start at um, 10 hertz and go to 2,000 hertz. Q is equal to 10. Fatigue exponent, 6.4. Now, it's definitely faster to do MATLAB max. We've talked about the difference between direct and max. And, and if, if you're going to do MATLAB max, which I encourage, that requires the installation of a C++ compiler, as well as some one-time uh, setup things that, we, that you would need to do. Let's go ahead and calculate our fatigue damage spectrum. Now embedded in the fatigue damage spectrum is the rainflow cycle counting. And we've talked about uh, rainflow cycle counting and, and fatigue damage in, in the last couple of uh, webinar units. And we'll continue to do so. Actually, I think we'll probably just, we'll, we'll come back to that in a few minutes. <laughs> Let's go back to our slides here. So what I have are the screenshots for how to calculate the SRS and also how to calculate the fatigue damage spectrum for our sign on random time history. Okay, now the next thing we're going to do is uh, we're going to derive an equivalent power spectral density, a PSD, to cover the sign on random specification. And the justification for this is going to be the FDS method. That's going to be the primary justification method. But we're also going to take a look at the SRS as well, and that will become clear as we, as we go through the exercise how we do that. And our approach here is going to be to replace these sine tones with narrow bands. So what we're going to end up with is a narrow band random against broadband random. And it's going to be kind of a hybrid PSD. And in order to do this uh, so-called equivalence, we're going to assume that the component is a spring mass single degree of freedom system. Its natural frequency is going to be an independent variable. The amplification factor is Q is equal to 10. And the fatigue exponent, as recommended by Steinberg, is 6.4. Now, if, if you have, for your case, if you have a different amplification factor that you'd like to use or a different uh, fatigue exponent, then be my guest. Uh, do, do your own thing. Or if you have uncertainties about the amplification factor or fatigue exponent, then you can run a couple of different uh, permutations. So now that I've discussed that, what the setup is for the uh, next exercise, let's go back and finish this off here for the... Uh, Okay, where did our progress bar? It should be done now. Okay, there, there we go. <laughs> it's finally done. Plots came up. So we have a acceleration fatigue damage spectrum. This is for that sign on random time history. And we've got Q is equal to 10, B is equal to 6.4, and the two spectral peaks, one at 100, the second at 180 hertz. 
And our damage index is g raised to the power of 6.4. That's the fatigue exponent. And that's all uh, is a function of natural frequency in hertz. So let's save that as, uh, as the uh, SOR underscore FDS. Saved into the workspace. OK, now back to slides. So I know we're jumping back and forth a bit here. So, so the reason, you know, why would, why would we ever want to do this? Well, it could be that for our shaker control computer, um, it cannot ta take a sign on random input specification. M maybe that was an extra module that costs another $10,000 and, and the, and the vendor is trying to make money off of us. So, uh, uh, we, we got to pay extra for that module, but, uh, may maybe this is just going to be a one-time test. So we don't want to spend $10,000 on a software upgrade. So what we can do instead is substitute an equivalent power spectral density that's equivalent in its uh, uh, damage uh, potential and, 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 and use that to cover our sign on random test. And somewhat similar if we're in the purely analytical finite element structural analysis world, uh, it, it may be just easier or efficient or convenient to do to, to our analysis in terms of just a single PSD rather than trying to somehow combine sign on random uh, in, a, in, a, in our NASTRAN run. That, I'll leave that up to you. I just want you to have as many tools as possible. So the next thing we do is do this conversion process. So I'm going to show you how to do that uh, within the vibration data GUI package. So let's go to vibration data, fatigue toolbox, and we're going to go down to the well, over to the right here, we have under miscellaneous, we have convert sign on random spec to composite PSD. Let's perform that analysis. And again, the justification will be in terms of fatigue damage spectrum. But we're also going to check peak response too. So let's see. This function converts a sign on random specification to an equivalent composite PSD. The PSD must have two columns, frequency and hertz and acceleration in g squared per hertz. Now our PSD is going to be the NAVMAT specification. And we've got a choice. I'll, I'll show you 1 6th octave first, but then I want to switch to 1 12th octave. If we have our two sine tones we need to add in, we've got 100 hertz and 180 hertz. And for acceleration, 10 g for each. Q is equal to 10. That's 5% damping. Fatigue exponent 6.4. For now, we're going to accept the margin of 1.0 dB. And, and, and later on, I'm going to explain to you uh, the significance of that margin. But for now, let's just accept the default. So we're going to take those two pure sine tones and replace them each with narrow bands that are 1 6 octave wide each, and then superimpose those against the on NAVMAT specification. So let's do our calculation, and that calculation goes very quick. And here we are. So this is a power spectral density, g squared per hertz, which is really GRMS squared per hertz, versus frequency in hertz. We have one band centered at 100 hertz, the second band centered at 180 hertz, and this band here is 1 6 octave wide, as is this band. And also, just to make things just a little bit more neat and tidy, I'm allowing a, a sloped line here rather than a sheer vertical wall. And then same on the, uh, the downward slide as well. So this, this now is, I'm going to call this a candidate. This is a candidate power spectral density, a composite power spectral density to to represent our sign on random environment. I have not proven that to you to you yet. I need to. But I'm just saying that this for now is our candidate. Now, another approach we can take if we want to have something that that that's a little bit more clo closer match for the true environment is we can narrow these bands to 1 12th octave. And what's the right answer for your your test or analysis problem? I don't know. I'm not that smart. You figure that out on, on your own. I just give you these options. So what if we do the same thing but have 1 12th octaves? 
So here's our 1 12th octave uh, narrow bands superimposed against the NAVMAT specification. Again, I put in some transition ramps there. So let's go ahead. We're going we're gonna to run with the uh, 1 12th octave uh, PSD. Or I should say the PSD with the sine tones represented in terms of 1 12th octave. Uh, narrow bands, and let's call this uh, EQ underscore PSD. That's equivalent PSD, but really, it's 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 a candidate. It's a candidate for equivalency. We have not verified its equivalency yet. We're going to do that. So now we have this uh, this uh, so-called uh, candidate equivalent PSD. So let's do a couple of things with it. Let's uh, let's take a uh, a fatigue damage spectrum. Actually, we're going to do both a VRS and a fatigue damage spectrum. And there's a couple ways we can do that here. Uh, so we've, we've actually run this dialog function before. This script calculates the vibration response spectrum, VRS, of a single degree of freedom system to a base input power spectral density. The fatigue damage uh, spectrum, FDS, may also be calculated. The input array must have two columns frequency in hertz and in our case we're going to have g squared per hertz so that's eq underscore psd preloaded into matlab english units q is equal to 10 60 second long duration let's plot from 10 to 2000 So here is our base input PSD. This is our candidate PSD for the equivalency. And here is the acceleration response spectrum, this time going out to 2,000 hertz, Acceler acceleration vibration response spectrum. Again, the, the P curve, the blue curve there, that's the one we want to save because it's uh, analogous to a shock response spectrum. Then we have our fatigue damage spectrum here. So we have the uh, damage index is G raised to the power of 6.4 versus natural frequency in hertz. And each of these two different types of uh, uh, spec spectral plots, we see that the effect of the, of the sine tones, 100 hertz, 180 hertz. We, say, we see that in each case. So now that we've established these curves, we want to save them. So the first thing we're going to do is save our our peak acceleration, which is uh, essentially an SRS type function. So I'm going to call this EQ underscore SRS. Let's save that. Now I also want to save that FDS, that fatigue damage spectrum. So let's call that EQ underscore FDS. Let's go ahead and save that one. Okay, so now that we have those functions saved, what are we going to do with them? So let's go to back to our vibration data software. And we're going to do a multiple curve uh, plot. So we've got plot utilities here. And let's do a multiple curve plot. We, for what we're going to do, we're gonna, we could use two curves, but I actually like the multiple curve uh, function better. So we, we've run this one before. So let's plot. Uh, Let's, let's, let's start with our shock response spectrum. So we've got our sign on random shock response spectrum. And we have, by way of analogy, we have our equivalent, a candidate PSD equivalent SRS. It's really a, a, a VRS peak, but it's a, it can be compared to an SRS. And we have, uh, okay, this is the sign on random. This is from the sign on random synthesis. And this is from our candidate uh, equivalent, I'll call it EQPSD. Title this as a shock response spectrum. Q is equal to 10. Let's call this uh, figure 12. The x-axis is going to be natural frequency in hertz. Log log plots. Uh, let's go from 10 to 2,000 hertz. 
You can plot both curves, one and two. The y-axis will be, uh, it's going to be the peak acceleration in G. We'll leave that as log. And let's see what we get. Now, we've got an interesting comparison here. This is uh, the shock response spectrum, Q is equal to 10. And we've got peak acceleration in G and natural frequency in Hertz. Now, the, the sign on random, this is for the time history synthesis. And for the time history synthesis, that's the blue curve. So that is the shock response spectrum of that blue curve. The blue curve is the shock response spectrum of our time history which is the pure sign on random time history. Now our candidate equivalent power spectral density has the shock response spectrum represented by the, the red curve. It's really the peak VRS, but that's uh, effectively the same thing as a, a shock response spectrum. And the good news is, is that our equivalent PSD pretty much envelops the sign on random curve but we're going to have to, to uh, allow for the fact that it is overly conservative at each of the two sine tones. And, and the fact that there's a little exceedance out here, we're not going to worry about that. Now, part of the reason we had that 1 dB margin was so that uh, at, at the low frequency end and the high frequency end, uh, we, we, we could get some good enveloping, or, or the, we would have a valid envelope. Uh, now, kind of the more we got, we got two conclusions here. If our sole concern is the peak response or shock response spectrum, uh, then our equivalent PSD, it is good to go. It is good to go in terms of representing the, the effect of the sign on random base input with, with the noted conservatism at the, at the two uh, sign frequencies. Now, now really, the moral of this is for design purposes, the natural frequency of our structure it should be mounted such that it's, if we could idealize it as a spring mass system, its natural frequency is 50 hertz or lower, or it's uh, about 360 hertz or higher. And that would be per the one octave rule. And the, 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 the one octave rule is maybe even a little more conservative than is needed. It looks like, uh, you know, as long as we're going up to, we, we could be as high as 80 hertz or so, or we could be maybe, uh, no, let's say about 250 hertz or so, uh, wi without any notable, without any uh, real added uh, conservatism in our equivalent PSD. But uh, re regardless, wh wh whether whether we're we're concerned about uh, uh, this the, the the direct sign on random or equivalent PSD, re 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 regardless of that, it's just good engineering pac practice to avoid having a natural frequency of our item line up with either of those two <laughs> uh, spectral uh, frequencies there. Okay, so in terms of our candidate PSD, again, we came out, uh, we, we've got a good envelope, except we've got some very conservative margin at each of the two uh, pure sine tones. Now, the next thing to do is com compare the FDS, the fatigue damage spectrum. So if I've done everything correct, I can just substitute FDS for SRS. And I think everything else is going to, well, there's going to be some changes, aren't there? We've got to change this title to fatigue damage spectrum. And the fatigue exponent is, we need to enter that in at 6.4. Let's make this figure 11, plot the two curves. Now our x or excuse me, our y-axis label is going to be damage. And this is a relative damage index. It doesn't have any absolute meaning. It's just for relative comparison purposes. And since we have 6.4, we have to use curly brackets uh, to make that come out all, all neat and tidy and pretty. Let's see if I did that right or not. Oops. OK. So what we have here is the fatigue damage spectrum. We've got damage of uh, the G level raised to the power of 6.4. This is a relative damage versus natural frequency in hertz. And we've got our equivalent PSD candidate. Our and we've got our sign on random, the blue curve. And you can see and what happens below 20 hertz is actually not, not, 
is not a concern since our spec begins at 20 hertz. But you can see that uh, the the red curve for our candidate equivalent PSD envelops the, the damage from the sign on random with, with a very uh, tight margin. We get a little bit of conservatism there at the two spectral peaks. And uh, par part of the reason we had that 1 dB margin earlier was, was uh, so that away from the, the sinusoidal frequencies, the enveloping, um, we, 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 would have a, we, we would have an envelope with positive margin for a candidate PSD. Now, because our, our let's, let's, let's get our two plots back into to view here. We've got fatigue damage spectrum, we've got shock response spectrum. So if, if, we, if we take a look at these, these two, this pair of, of, of curves here, we can say that uh, our, our, our equivalent PSD is good to go to represent the uh, damage potential of the sign on random environment. So it's no longer a candidate. We can now inaugurate <laughs> the equivalent PSD into office, so to speak. Th that's all well and good, but just, just be aware, again, that we have some conservatism in terms of peak response. And, and that's just uh, something we have to accept. I anytime we're doing any sort of equivalency, there's always going to be a trade-off where in one regard or another we're going to be uh, conservative. And in this case, the conservatism is going to happen with uh, the, the peak response. But as long as our system is linear, as, as long as we're well below the yield stress, for example, then that's probably not going to be an issue at all. So I think we've done a good job there. Now, you may agonize a little bit. We'll say, well, I don't know if my Q is 10 or Q could be 30 or 50 and fatigue exponent could be 4, low as 4, as high as 9. Uh, go, go back and, and, and substitute uh, your own set of values. Do a parametric study or family or, or whatever. Uh, if you want to be if if you want to be conservative, uh, but 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 don't don't be too conservative. <laughs> find, find, find some balance because uh, the, the the point the point is for for our complex equipment we seldom if ever know what uh, the fatigue exponent really is and we we just uh, we just depend on the good reputation of uh, Dr. Steinberg that uh, for the case of an electronic box 6.4 is a good value. And, and then the, the Q value, uh, Q cannot be analytically predicted. It can only be measured. Of course, you could say the same thing for the fatigue exponent. So uh, b b best wishes and, and good luck to everyone on, on uh, assembling your Q value and your fatigue exponent. <laughs> uh, let's see. I think we're pretty much done with the, well, there's a couple other two or three things we can do, can't we? Let's just, uh, for fun, we, we have our equivalent PSD, so one thing we could do for fun, and I encourage you to do this as an exercise, is let's, let's go ahead and synthesize a time history for our equivalent PSD. And 60 seconds long. In this case, since we have those narrow bands, we also want a narrow delta F. So I'm going to do, I'm going to scratch my head a little bit and Pick choice seven here. That'll be a delta F of about one hertz. And we'll see what kind of a uh, sign on random uh, time history do we get? Well, this is actually it's not a sign on random time history. This is an equivalent narrow band against broadband random time history to represent a sign on random environment. So here is the result of our synthesis in terms of the PSD matchup. Okay, there's the acceleration time history. So this is a, let's call this the narrow band. We've got two narrow bands against the broadband random time history uh, chosen to represent the fatigue damage of a pure sign on random specification. So that's what a narrow band against broadband random time history looks like. Now the, the histogram is actually going to come up back to the bell curve shape. So what we're doing is we're, is we're taking the, the, the true sign on random environment has a histogram which is not quite a bell curve. It's more of a kind of a triangular thing with a brim. In this case for our equivalent uh, time history, our narrow band against broadband random time history, we're back to the bell curve uh, histogram. So that's just something to keep in mind in the back of your head. 
Um, I think if we looked at the kurtosis, it come out to about 3.0. And I'm thinking what I need to do as an upgrade to this uh, synthesis program is to uh, have the kurtosis value output into the command window. Okay, we're getting to the home stretch here. Uh, the remainder of this PowerPoint presentation is really is just the uh, screenshots of what we just did. So again, I'd like you to do this as homework exercises. Go back and play with these things. If you want to try substituting different amplification values or fatigue exponents, by all means do that. If you want to try different uh, sine tone bandwidths for the narrow bands, equivalent narrow bands, you can do that. You can just play with this however you like. And these are just, again, the, uh, the screenshots of uh, representing what I just demonstrated in class. And we talked about our comparison and verification steps where we uh, had our candidate PSD in our synthesis. Looks like uh, the, the legend uh, titles were, were a bit different for the uh, PowerPoint slide uh, screenshots, and that's OK. And we, s we found out that for t fatigue, uh, Damage spectra. Our candidate PSD had a, he had a pretty tight envelope with regard to the uh, the synthesis, which was the pure uh, sign on random time history. So the so 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 that was good because we we want we want when we do this enveloping and equivalency process, we want to avoid being overly conservative. Conservatism is a good thing as long as we understand that and treat it separately. And then we did the. Uh, I'm saying that the, based on the Rayleigh distribution, the peak VRS can be compared against a shock response spectrum. And when we did that, we found out, well, we still got a good envelope, except we have uh, margin to spare at the two sinusoidal frequencies in terms of peak response. So uh, just, just be aware of that. Maybe that's a problem. Maybe it's not. As, as long as the natural frequency is, say, one octave away from either those two for from from those two peaks then th th then we probably don't mind that conservativeism and if our natural frequency does match up with with either those two peaks we probably want to do a redesign <laughs> okay so in conclusion the equivalent psd was derived for the sign on random specification the equivalent psd replaced the sine tones with narrow bands the equivalent psd was realistic in terms of fatigue damage enveloping that was conservative in terms of the peak response level. And then I've got as an extra homework exercise, you can synthesize a time history to satisfy the equivalent PSD. Actually, I demonstrated that in class. So that concludes our webinar for today. So hope you enjoyed this. Email me if you have any questions, and we'll catch you next, next time. So thank you, and goodbye for now. <laughs>